this event is being led by the Physical Education um, Network as part of CIRA. I'm going to ask our presenters today, please, to unmute yourselves because I muted everybody earlier. Um, and a reminder that the session's being recorded. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over to Shirley, who will introduce the session today and our panel. Thanks, Nicola. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Um, my name is Shirley Gray, and I'm from the University of Edinburgh. And as Nicola said, I'm the co-convener of uh, Scott Parent, so that's the Scottish Physical Education Research Network. So we're one of the CERA networks. Uh, we're a group of researchers and teachers from around Scotland, not only with an interest in physical education, but also with an interest in the health and wellbeing curriculum more broadly, which is the focus of today's discussion. And so the main objective for today is to have a really constructive and supportive discussion about supporting pupils' health and well-being as they return to school. Um, but before we get started, I'd quickly like to say that I've been supported with the organisation of today's session by Stephanie Hartley, Ruth McQuillan and Deb Holt, and they're all researchers from the University of Edinburgh with an interest in school health and well-being. Uh, today we're going to have a panel discussion with three teachers, two deputy heads and a head teacher, who are currently and very heavily engaged in uh, work around how to support the health and well-being of their pupils as they return to school. The teachers involved today are Tina Stone, she's a 2 to 18 head teacher at Dornoch Firth Campus in the Highlands, Jane Mingus, a deputy head teacher at the Royal High School in Edinburgh, and Mary Hume, a deputy head teacher at New Battle High School in Midlothian. Through this panel discussion, they'll talk about their current priorities for supporting the pupils' health and well-being and also what they think their priorities might be for the first few months when their pupils return to school. Um, the format of the session will be pretty straightforward. I'll firstly ask the panel members to say a wee bit more about themselves and the context of their work, and then I'll ask a few questions to initiate discussion. Whilst they're engaged in discussion, please use the chat function on Zoom to pose any questions, comments or observations that you might have. Um, my colleague Stephanie, she'll review these questions and then she'll pose the questions to the panel that seem to be pertinent or recurring. So I believe there might also be some um, Twitter engagement with Twitter if, if that's um, your preferred means of communication. Now, we completely understand that many of you will probably have spent quite a bit of time sitting in front of a laptop today. So for your own health and well-being, if you do need to leave the session and enjoy the sunshine, that's completely fine. Okay, so let's get started. Let's meet the panel. So firstly, I'd like the panel just to introduce themselves, say a bit about who they are and the context in which they work. Uh, Mary, do you want to go first? Uh, hi there, yeah, I'm Mary Hume. I'm Deputy Head Teacher Pupil Support here at New Battle High School um, in Dalkeith in Midlothian. Um, and I've been here for four years, um, initially as timetabler, but for the last two years in pupil support, which is my background of over 20 years in City of Edinburgh Council. Thank you. D Jen, do you want to go? Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Jen Mingus and I'm Deputy Head Teacher at the Royal High School in Edinburgh. I've worked at the Royal High School now for 20 years, never intended for staying quite that long, but when you find somewhere that you really love, then it's hard to leave. Um, my main role within the school is uh, timetabling, but I also have a specific responsibility for mental health. My background is PE, so obviously I'm very passionate about the whole wellbeing agenda, so delighted to be here today. Thanks, Jen. And Tina? Hi, I'm Tina Stones. I'm usually the 2 to 18 head teacher at Dornock Firth Campus. Um, that's two primary schools and the secondary school. Um, but I've been seconded out over the last couple of months to help with um, health and wellbeing and some transitions across um, the area, obviously, to support head teachers um, in schools. Uh, my background is additional support needs and um, pastoral support as well. So I was a deputy head for a long time over in Culloden Academy and um, the secondary school there. Um, so I have a huge passion and commitment to children's health and well-being. That's great. Okay, so I'm just going to throw the first question at you and whoever wants to jump in first, that would be great. So what have been your main priorities in planning, so your current planning to support young people's health and well-being for their return to school and why, why are those your priorities at this stage? Go. Right. <laughs> Um, I could talk a bit um, Thank you, about what we did here in Midlothian. Um, we're a small authority, 
Um, so there was a strategy group set up right well, very early on um, with health and wellbeing as one of its strands and that was led by, we have a fantastic um, principal ed educational psychologist, Lisa Randall, um, so worked with a group of um, well, myself and some primary head teachers and people from social work, etc. So we, we and health, we had quite a wide variety. And I suppose what we started to think about then was a, what were we going to have to really consider about our staff and how they were going to be able to support young people when we come back? Because we really feel that, you know, staff stability and the messages that they are giving is going to be extra crucial um, when, when we return and the sorts of key messages that we that we want them to be able to, to pass on to young people and also what we were really deal or what we might be dealing with when the when the, the young people return because I suppose yeah we've had a lot of contact with them during lockdown and, and you know that's been a key strength certainly of, of our school and a lot of schools in our area and um, so we have an idea a really good idea of where some of our young people are at so we just kind of thought along those sort of broad themes and um, really a lot of the time around loss and um, so yes there was the bereavement aspect of loss but there was the loss of jobs within the community there was the loss of financial stability that loss of physical connection with friends and family and for us a big thing the loss of routine and structure for our young people which many of our um, pupils really rely on quite heavily um, during the day when when we're with us so that work stream then um, sort of moved on and worked towards providing a toolkit for staff across the authority and um, to make that transition to to supporting the staff to be able to support the young people um, upon our return in August. Thanks for that, Mary. Uh, Jen or Tina, do you want to add to that or talk about your own experiences of um, the things that have been priorities for you now in the planning for your pupils returning? Jen, do you want me to come in there? Because um, obviously some of the work we've been doing has um, mirrored some of the work that Mary's been doing there. Certainly the educational psychology team have been um, a huge asset to all schools as we've looked at um, supporting the staff to support the children as they, as they transition. Um, this afternoon we also had a meeting to look at um, a summer programme for um, delivered by a, a range of practitioners on you know, the teenage brain, mindfulness, what to expect when you return to school because we'd, we'd surveyed um, young people across the area and there was quite a bit of anxiety coming back from, from the young people about what to expect, you know, health and safety and what happens if the virus comes back uh, and various anxieties around that and many have completely missed their friends and missed school which is good to know um, but I think you know this it's um, a program to act as a bridge to young people going back into um, a routine that, that like Mary said they've been completely out of for quite some time and that's been hard and um, for many families as, as well as the, the, the children. Thanks Tina. Jen? Yeah okay so um I can give a kind of different perspective on what I've been working on just because of the remit that, that I do in terms of the timetable. So my priority is very much about trying to bring pupils back as many as possible in a sa the safest way possible. Now that has been exceptionally challenging um, as that changes almost on a daily basis of what the expectations are. I mean, you have all been on this journey together, so you know how difficult it has been that Edinburgh were one of the authorities that were first to release um, their model. Um, and understandably, that provoked quite a lot of reaction within the media. Mm -hmm. So we are now in a position where the ultimate goal is to get everybody back uh, in August. However, there are significant uh, issues and uncertainties that still surround that. So, really, the work that I've been doing is to try and I suppose support people's mental health um, and well-being by bringing them back in a way in which they will feel that they, under they understand why the decisions have been made um, to provide that kind of structure and certainty uh, and unfortunately we're still not at that stage however a number of pupils have responded very positively to the idea that we will be back full time in school and things can start to take you know take on some sort of normality again um, so that's where my work has been very much been centered around but reassuring pupils that um, they can come back they can catch up for many of our senior pupils 
um, it's about reinforcing with them that a lot of the time that they've had during lockdown they wouldn't have normally had um, because it would have been on exam leave so they would have had the three weeks in uh, June and it's about that reassurance that um, it's okay if they haven't kept up because we can come back within whatever that structure looks like and continue to, to build on and develop further. Thanks, Jen. So some common features across each, um, each of the schools. Um, you've talked about some of the strategies that you've been employing, some more general, some more targeted. I'm just wondering, Tina, you mentioned that you actually carried out a survey. What informed the decisions that you made about what you had to do now to support the young people's health and well-being? Um, was it something quite systematic like a, a survey or was that your knowledge of the area? Was, it, was there something else that happened there? Um, several. So um, a survey went out to broad general education pupils, senior phase pupils and, and parents as well. Um, so the educational psychology team and a business analyst analysed that data and looked at the core themes that were coming um, from the young people in the different age ranges and also from the parents as well. Um, understandably, parents have had a huge amount of anxiety as well about health and safety and, you know, the phased return at the time, because obviously this was a couple of weeks ago, um, going back to, to school. And um, so from that, we've, we've designed different um, activities to support young people. We also divided it into areas, looking at the, the different geographical locations to see if something needed to be differentiated for specific areas. Um, and obviously you have a huge amount of knowledge in your own context, in your own community as well. Um, and we carried out community consultation meetings. So we were linking in with local businesses um, to get an understanding of, of some of the um, challenges that people are facing in, in their own communities as well. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Mary or Jen, do you want to add to that at all, just about the things that informed some of the decisions in your thinking around um, supporting people's health and well-being? Again, some of, some of that certainly for us was what was coming back from, from our teams. So um, right from the get-go, our, our pastoral team in school, you know, we, we said to them we, we wanted every family to be contacted and, and spoken with, and obviously some a lot more than others um, during that time. Um, and, you know, the families have been great at, in, at interacting and letting us know what is it, you know, what is it you need from right from the start when they were needing um, the sort of the digital devices that we that we issued and the, the dongles for the Wi-Fi. So basics like that, but also saying, you know, this is what we're struggling with. This is what our young people are saying, whether that was the anxiety initially um, around exams or what, what it was that we that they were needing. And we were feeding that back into the strategy group as well, uh, that these were the things that were coming up again and again and what could what could we provide and sort of middle and worked on um, sort of ways to well-being that they could use to support and they were looking at specific things that were coming back from our middle Odian champions which is our um our youngsters who um, are care experienced who have a really strong voice and a strong group within the authority and um, so they were saying you know these are the sorts of things that, that we want as well so again surveys yes and um, direct feedback that we were getting from from the youngsters Thanks, Mary. Uh, Jen, do you want to add to that at all? Uh, we, we haven't completed any surveys, but like Barry, um, pupils have been in contact with our pupil support teachers and um, through those discussions, they're identifying some of the, the key issues, some of the what we perceive to be a lack of engagement. There are always other issues behind that and it's really trying to communicate that um, information effectively across our school community so that we aren't putting unnecessary pressure on pupils where they just are unable for whatever reason to do that. So wellbeing has certainly been at the heart of those communications and how do we support rather than the challenge aspect. Um, Stephanie, do we have any questions from the chat for the panel yet? Sorry, no, no, not yet. Oh, well, there's one there from oh, the now. Field, I think. <laughs> Just now. All right. What has the response been from pupils about the recent announcement that the aim is for everyone to be back in school full time in August? Do anyone want to talk to that then? Um, um, yeah, because certainly there have been a number of pupils who have responded very positively to that. And that's the way it should be. I mean, we should be aspirational to hope that if it is safe to do so, we want everybody back. 
I think, unfortunately, as soon as that announcement was made on the back of that, there is the media storm that comes afterwards. And that uncertainty is, is still there and will continue throughout the summer. So um, that transition, you know, will, will not be August. It really is continuing throughout the summer and it's about trying to calm the waters and make sure that we still keep communications, whether that be at an authority level or national level, to try and reassure because we just, there's still so much uncertainty as to what that return mm -hmm. may look like. Yeah, thanks Jen. Uh, Mary or Tina, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I've, I've been um, doing a lot of primary visits this week when the primary sevens have been back in the primary schools. So we've had staff going out to, to meet with each group. I mean, they are so excited because they're just really excited at having done their virtual transition and just kind of wanting to get in and get started. Um, and I know speaking to some of them, they were saying, well, it, it's exciting for us that we will maybe get to try a lot of the subjects that we were thinking we might not get to try because, you know, they really want to do the science, they want to do the, the, the CDT and the home economics, the, the more practical things that they don't always have as much opportunity opportunity to do with, with them without the right facilities um, so they, they were very excited but again there was one or two that said you know but but what will still be in place in terms of restrictions they wanted to know um, one of them said not because I'm necessarily really anxious about it but I just want to know that I'm doing the right thing when I come into the into the building um, and I've spoken to we we're operating as a hub so um, I've bumped into some of our pupils as I'm leaving um, each night and they're down sort of doing their exercise and I spoke to a couple of them and they were like we have so missed school we just want to get back in we're missing everyone but then one of them said you know but I don't want to take it home to my gran. So there is still that, they just want that reassurance about what it's going to be like if everyone's, everyone's back in. Yeah, great, thanks. Tina, do you want to add to that? I think exactly what Mary said there, I think that encapsulates it perfectly. It's, um, yes, excitement, because obviously there's been this period of uncertainty, but there's a, an underlying nervousness about the impact of that. Yeah, great. Um, I don't know if there's another question, but um, is there another question, Stephanie? Yeah, um, kind of relating to what you were just talking about. So, uh, Rachel asked if anything has been decided in relation to shielding, pupils that are shielding, um, and how that might affect uh, the transition back. Hey. I am um, due to the, uh, I suppose, a surprise announcement on Monday. That information is just starting to, to trickle out just now. Um, we are aware that a number of pupils may still be shielding, and therefore the work that um, the pupils who have returned are doing will have to be made available, and um, you know, in a similar way to what they've been doing currently. So, um, yes, there will be. Um, I suppose measures put in place to make sure that everyone is included, whether that is at, from home or if you're in school, what measures or additional risk assessments we put in place to make sure that everybody can return safely. Yeah. It's a shifting landscape, isn't it? Um, we might ha still have some more questions, but Stephanie, if you just keep your eye on the questions and then we'll have time after um, the next discussion to come back to some of these if that's okay. So really we've talked about what you're currently doing and, and your priorities and why those might be your priorities and um, the information that you've been gathering to help inform the decisions that you've been making. So that's the now if you like. I want you to, and I'm very aware that we've just said it's a shifting landscape, I'd like you to sort of project forward in a, a few weeks. So the first term back to school, what do you think your priorities for young people's health and wellbeing will be then and why? Uh, Tina, do you want to start with this one? Sure, okay. So um, we've, we've been having a look at that. We've, we've had um, a number of practitioners and head teachers working, um, looking at what the, the priorities might be. And obviously, we, we don't know at the moment what, what it's going to look like. But um, I think you've probably all seen the Education Scotland resources on transitions. And there was a huge amount of information in there about health and well-being and trauma-informed approaches. So um, it's certainly something that is worth us thinking about as we start to look at that return to school and what it might be like. Because although some young people might be absolutely fine, then some, some time into the term, they might actually not be okay at that point. And it's about us all being aware um, and sensitive, as we always are anyway, but maybe additionally sensitive um, to potential 
um, issues further down the line. Um, and we also met with our community groups to share those materials as well. So local businesses and practitioners and other agencies can also use the same approach. So there's consistency across um, areas. Oh, my screen's frozen. Are you all still there? I think Shirley might have. I think it's Shirley's. Oh, okay. so <laughs> <laughs> Well, would Mary or, or Jen, would you like to speak on that question? Yeah, I suppose one thing that, that we've sort of thought out in terms of the, the planning and, 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 you know, similar with, with Tina, because for, for a lot of people's you know, we won't know until they're actually back in the building and what's and as you say it's that longer term because initially there might be the kind of you know I like to use the word euphoria but some of them are really really excited about coming back in um, and being in but it's it's the longer term and i think that is where our work with staff really has to come to the fore um, I think particularly um, being able to, to spot things. Lisa Randall, as I said, our head of site, she spoke about, you know, expect big behaviours. And that doesn't mean in terms of the acting out, but it means that sort of more pronounced version of whatever way a youngster is communicating how they're, they're feeling to you. And, um, you know, certainly for, for us, I think we have to make staff very aware of, of their role um, in supporting that, but also their role in terms of, for example, language used in the classroom, language used to talk about lockdown or to talk about COVID experience, you know, things like making sure that all staff are aware of any youngsters who, you know, have suffered a bereavement during, um, during the time, not just those who um, the bereavement might be related to COVID, because every, every then every mention of COVID and lockdown, that's going to be a trigger for that young person, but also those who have had bereavements for other reasons during that time because you know they probably haven't gone through um, what we would call perhaps the more normal natural process because they've not been able to have perhaps the coming together of family members that you would expect to help them get through that so I think um, language of staff and just those key messages of um, resilience as well that not every child and young person will have been traumatized or anxious by this but we've got to be able to spot the ones who are so it's spotting the differences in behavior and being able to acknowledge and validate their emotions not trying to fix them nor dismiss them and for us it's going to be about that resilience because actually this is a real life real time opportunity to start developing this with some young people and part of that is us saying you know we're here, we've been through this um, together, but we're back and we're moving forward. Jen, do you have anything you wanna add? No, I, I completely agree with uh, Barry in that I think the staff are key initially in terms of um, them modeling positive calm behavior. I mean, and that's very difficult to do with staff. I mean, they're transitioning back too a very you know an unknown world with I'm sure many concerns that they'll have over their own health <clears throat> but I think it's imperative that staff do take the lead sorry I'll just take a wee drink um, and creating that very calm environment I know many schools have a number of staff trained in um, as mental uh, health first aiders and it's building on that to make sure that everyone feels skilled and supported and actually having those conversations with young people and having it in a way that keeps things calm. The only the thing that I've been reflecting back on recently was when we made that move from standard grade to nationals. There were a number of, um, of pupils who fed back to us that their anxiety was being heightened as a result of staff sharing or oversharing um, their concerns about new assessment methodologies. And I think, you know, it'd be good to learn from that as we move forward in that you know, we need to be careful about how we, you know, how we share our own concerns with pupils um, and that we have to, you know, keep that kind of calm and positive and keep moving forward and reassure because there will still be uncertainties. There'll be uncertainties for those who are coming back um, in terms of SQA, the results and the, the post certification review process and then looking further ahead as to what the following years um, examination system may or may not look like. I think Shirley's still broken. <laughs> okay. Um, so is there anything in particular that 
any particular training or anything like that that you think might help with that um, to help support staff more or have you been sort of um do you, do you want me to come in there? Probably, sure. probably Mary's got some similar as well. Um, so you, you've got various packages and I suspect many um, of our colleagues here today have similar ones. So you have seasons for growth um, if, if it's required for bereavement. I know um, Mary spoke about um, bereavement earlier. The, the tra trauma-informed training, there's a free course on Future Learn, um, which is it's only a couple of hours and that's quite a, a handy one for people who are, are new maybe into, into that field. Um, and I would agree very much though with what Jen said, and that was a very strong message from our educational psychologist, which is, you know, present, model that behavior, that it's calm, it's a structured environment, and um, you know, we're back, it's good to see you, and then look very carefully in case there is an issue there where we need to give additional support to the, to the young people. Um, but the educational psychologists in local areas are the, are the experts that will have access to various training programs. I think the Ways to Wellbeing is also a very good resource. And I would add that I think it's, it's fair to say that um, what we found in our school is, um, you know, how brilliantly staff have recognised that they are going to play a role in this and the number of them who have availed themselves of all these different free courses that have been available online, particularly, I would say there was quite a peak on social media when it was mental health and bereavement was being spoken about a lot and there were a lot of courses that were up and running um, and we've had a large number of staff who you know have let us know that they've completed that um, during lockdown so they absolutely recognize I think um, their role when, when youngsters return not just the not just the staff who have the specific responsibility for that but the the staff right across the school um, I want to bring up one question that came up in the chat um, in relation to, um, Jordan said, how do we make sure that staff prioritize health and well-being when they return? Um, there will be an inevitable drive to get back to delivering content-based teaching. Do you want me to go? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think and it would be good to get um, Mary and uh, Jen's view as well. Um, I think that would come from the, the agreement in the in the school improvement plan. Um, so when we speak about a school improvement plan at the moment, it's a very, very um, strict focus on what is actually needed to support those young people and teachers back into um, the school environment. So I think the core theme would be around health and well-being and then that, that's a whole school or a whole campus approach to making sure that everybody gets looks after one another and gets back into that rhythm of education and it's a recovery curriculum you know there's lots of documentation out there about that. Um, Mary do you want to be nodding? Yeah. I would say that I suppose I think it also depends on where your school was at in terms of having that kind of nurturing approach as well with it right across your staff as opposed to um, just within certain departments within within your school um, but also another thing that, that we will do on return that we have done as we're planning you know it will be a particular focus on our in-service days when we come back in August and we will talk through with staff um, how they can do this they do have access to the full toolkit that um, that the group um, that Lisa Randall led um, has produced for Midlothian so that is all there but I think you know we as SLT will be standing up at the start and talking them through you know that this is going to be for all of us and um, we're all going to have to do this and I think we're, we're, we're certainly very lucky here and that staff absolutely see their role um, as you know as health and well-being for all across across the school and looking after the youngsters but I think so I think some of that depends on the, the work you'll have to do with that and, and stressing that to staff will depend on where you already were with your staff on that prior to prior to lockdown. Yeah, completely agree. Um, I'm sure like many other schools, you've you've been part of that change um, throughout lockdown where staff are the relationships that they have with young people have only strengthened further. And I think they strengthened through um, the relationships, uh, noting their well-being and sharing those concerns, and that's not just from your kind of guidance teacher. That's staff right across the school. That many pupils have reached out to to staff that they wouldn't have had they been in a school environment. But the way in which staff have been interacting, um, you know, um, through um, their iPads, you know, in our case, in our school, um, and the feedback that they've been getting. Um, 
really puts us in a strong position moving forward. And staff are undoubtedly are aware that the pressures that they'll be under in terms of delivering, if you like, the content required for SQA. But at the forefront, I think that, you know, will be their well-being and that will continue. Um, so I think, you know, we're in a very positive place moving forward. And yes, there'll be challenges, but, you know, yes, the SLT need to take the lead on that and reassure staff that well-being is at the centre of everything. And then, you know, attainment and achievement will come after that. Nice also had a question. Um, she said, is there anything um, being put in place to, to help particular um, groups that might struggle with changes such as autistic pupils? Have any of your schools been doing anything in particular? Um, one, one thing that we've looked at, um, we've, we've got a fantastic new building here, but where our support for learning base is, is just now is kind of sort of within the main part of the building, but we do have access to our library space at the moment, which is much lighter and brighter and bigger and more spaced out. So, um, you know, that's we're, we're looking at a change for the initial return to provide just, you know, extra space, extra breakout space um, to support that reintegration in, into school um, as well because we understand from from some of the work that's been done with some of our pupils particularly um, with additional needs particularly those with the VSD they're, they're, they're kind of worried about always being in that classroom enclosed setting um, you know in relation to to, to the virus so um, so I think practicalities um, have certainly come into to play for us and and again we have um, a sort of support within within Midlothian who has kept up the support of, um, of pupils with ASD and, and our pupils um, with ASN have been heavily supported by um, our support for learning department our learning assistance in terms of you know how they've continued throughout throughout lockdown but I think I think one of the things we're, we're, we're certainly thinking of is, you know, having, you know, whether we're all back on the first day or, or however that happens, that these youngsters will perhaps need a more gradual reintegration into, into their classes than, than some others just to, just to help them get back in. So just to say I'm lost with everything, my internet is melted and I've missed most of this. I'm so sorry. Uh, Stephanie, thanks for doing a grand job there. Uh, are there more questions from the audience? And Nicola had a couple questions. Um, so she said, like Jen was saying, I've heard teachers reflect that some pupils who would not speak out or engage as much have been engaging more through digital learning. So will there be a consideration of this when schools return, how to maintain digital context? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, right across Scotland, there has been a digital revolution um, and that's great to see. And we need to continue to build on that. So as senior leaders in the school, we need to facilitate that and support staff in uh, you know, maintaining that. What, what one of the issues that we will have is there's a number of young people who have been learning at home probably in a way that suits them much better than being in a classroom environment. And that their transition back to school is going to be challenging as well because some of them do find relationships and building relationships uh, challenging. So it's that helping them to reconnect, but also moving them away from the way in which they were learning to an environment where there are other people and relationships to develop. So um, that will be another factor to take into consideration. Mary or, or Tina, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I think I would agree with, with Jen's comments there. Okay. Um, another question, it was uh, a little bit earlier in the day, but kind of relates to digital um, ways of reaching students, was from Gabriella. She said she's looking um, into the possibility, possibility of using virtual reality to promote immersive meditation for relaxation and reduce anxiety. And have any of you ever explored um, this type of experience? And um, would it uh, possibly be beneficial to your students? It's not something that 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 we looked into, and we're um, 
our school is, I don't know if some of you may be aware of this, um, Digital Centre of Excellence, and we do a lot of work with um, Edinburgh University um, through um, one of our deputy head teachers, Mark Davidson, um, and they certainly kind of work with a lot of different research projects and, and how digital can, can support young people. Um, but that one, um, I, haven't, I haven't heard of, but I can imagine for, um, for some people, it might be particularly helpful, especially if you are in a building where you don't have um, the space to set up some sort of, you know, sensory room that would that would be of benefit. And I'm thinking particularly of of some of our, our pupils with um, additional support needs that could, you know, potentially really benefit from something like that. I agree. I think it's a fantastic idea. We we've been looking at meditation activities for young people, but not not like that. So I think it would be an excellent opportunity. Yeah, likewise, um, we have a, a health and wellbeing period uh, for S1 um, in which they've been working on the, uh, the wellbeing app. So they've been doing small tasks, mindfulness, and so yeah, anything that we can build on, um, absolutely, very welcome. Thanks, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm back for now. <laughs> uh, I'm just not sure where we're at, so I don't know whether it's worth you just continuing, Stephanie. Obviously, we have a question around looking to the future in terms of research and uh, sort of seeking teachers' perspective on where researchers might go with this in the future in order to support you guys and um, support young people in schools. So I don't know if you've touched on any of, of those ideas or issues yet. No, Nicholas No, okay. So, well, that's. I mean, that's really uh, just uh, finishing off, um, and then obviously, hopefully, fielding some more questions. But you know, there's a number of researchers listening to the discussion today, and they'll likely be thinking, well, well, you know, this is an interesting area. This is an interesting area. It requires a bit further examination, investigation. But from a teacher's perspective, you know, if you were to have some researchers come to your school, work with you. Where are the areas that you would like to know more about in, or, in order to inform your practice and improve things moving forward, again, in terms of young people's health and well-being? So, uh, Mary, do you want to go first? Is that OK? Yeah, I think, I think in, you know, in relation to, to what has happened, it's, it's, it's hard in the sense of until we actually have the pupils back with us in the building and there may be something absolutely jumps out at us even within the first week that we're thinking you know that, that we perhaps hadn't thought of that that you know that that, that rears its head in, in August and that we that we hadn't considered I suppose one thing I've been sort of thinking about is you know the the impact that this could potentially have on yes on the on the mental health of, of young people particularly the seniors because i think we are going to have a continued time of uncertainty um and i suppose there's 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 something there about tracking where they're at just now with their anxiety and where they're at as the as the term develops and we perhaps get more information about what might be happening because they're coming back to to learning in school and hopefully it will be all back in learning in school but I think they'll always have one eye on well what's happening with the virus now what's happening and and that sense of panic if you know if the word lockdown rears its head again or you know local lockdowns rear its head again or you know physical distancing in school and and reduced numbers I think I, I am concerned for, for some of the, and I say that as a, as a parent of a boy who's just started S5, you know, he's like, can't wait to get back into school, mum, and really get on with things. He's enjoying the home learning. Um, but then when they read the news, it's like, well, what if we get back and then we have to come out again? And it's, I, I just don't know how that will be affecting them in the background, if that makes sense. No, in perfect sense. It's really mm -hmm. interesting. Again, it's something that as a researcher, I hadn't really mm -hmm. contemplated, but that's a really interesting perspective. Tina or Jen, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I think I completely agree with um, everything Mary said there. One other area that might be of interest, it, it's not explicitly health and wellbeing, but very strongly linked to some of the feedback um, we got from young people was actually very positive about, um, we, we intentionally put a positive question in the questionnaire. So, you know, what, what have you learned from this experience? I can't remember exactly how it was worded. Um, and some young people fed back that they'd learned to learn independently much more than they thought they were able to. 
and I think that's a, a really important point for us all. And also they found they had more strength of character than, than they realised they had. Um, so I think those two um, strands would be quite interesting in, in a, you know, to look in, in, in a positive way, I suppose, at things we could research. Yeah, the, the only thing that I, that I could add to that is, um, I suppose, for, for if I reflect on um, my experience throughout this, it's how I have dealt with the uncertainty and the fact that uh, things change so frequently. So I haven't been able to offer pupils or parents a reassurance about, yes, we know, you know, we know what the future is going to hold and here's our plan that we have in place in order to, to bring about that change. So it would be interesting to know in terms of, you know, from a pupil's perspective, you know, what, what is it they need from us to help them deal with these uncertain times? Because until we find a vaccine, the worst case scenario is that we are in and out of lockdown or we're back at a third 50% move into 100 and, and, and that varies, you know, month on month, which would be a horrendous situation for us to be in. So how do we best help both staff and pupils deal with them these times that we've never experienced before in terms of uncertainty so so what have you learned from the situation now and how can you use that to be better prepared going forward for more uncertainty yeah yeah <laughs> interesting really interesting stephanie do we have any other questions uh, from the audience not yet does anyone have any other questions that they'd like to pose in the chat box There's a little bit of discussion, but not a not an actual question. I, I could maybe pick up a, a part on that about the, the for the pupils that are experiencing distance learning in a very positive way, and um, because we have a number of pupils, we have um, some closing the gap development officer posts, and part of what they do is um, outreach work with youngsters who, for whatever reason, um, are not attending or are unable to attend and they've had um, a lot of success with the distance learning with, with these young people ordinarily they'd maybe go out to the house and do do pieces of work with them and um, you know i'm thinking perhaps of you know of maybe a youngster who for whatever reason actually doesn't leave their, their bedroom but they'll sometimes come down and do a session and um, with one of these teachers but um you know many of these youngsters have engaged really well with the distance learning aspect and i suppose for us um we're we're thinking that that's certainly a way that that we can support even better in that role and um, to ensure that they all have their you know minimum of their five qualifications at, at a certain level by the time that they that they leave us so um although we had been using it before this has forced us to use it even more um and that has has been a, a success That's great, Mary. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, do you have any more questions? No, not, not currently. Um, Barbara, I know you, it looks like you're having a little conversation. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to add anything? Well, I think maybe we could, if, unless there are other questions, we could just... Um, I think, Shirley, the only thing I was going to add that Deb and Barbara and I have been having a bit of a chat around the points that Mary was raising and just about actually thinking about that distance, uh, that this learning in this way has actually been positive for a number of pupils and Jen pointed that out as well. And I just picked up off of that, you know, does this actually raise bigger questions that we actually need to be asking around the concept of school and schooling? And that is it is is it always got to be in, in, in this the building that we call the school, particularly as Mary was saying that actually we're seeing a lot of children really engaging that perhaps have been quite disengaged. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting how we utilize what we've learned from this. A really interesting, but really complex as well, I suppose, because while some young children's learning might be improved or enhanced through distance learning, and I really like that idea that some young people seem to have learned to learn independently. Um, I think that's, that's a great thing. Uh, but balancing that off with, you know, how is it affecting their health and well-being? What is it like being on their own, being in their room? Who are they engaging with? Um, for some, they might be happier, and that's not a bad thing, but for others, it might be more problematic. Um, but it's just really interesting and lots of areas to explore in the future and I hope that we've, we've um, through these discussions 
provided people with some ideas about what to do in their own schools but what to, and what to do moving forward and where there are some potential areas for research as well. Uh, do, yes, do, definitely. Do, Tina, uh, Jen and Mary, are there any final points that you would like to, to raise just before we, we finish, I think? Um, I suppose I would just kind of perhaps just reiterate that I think so much of us supporting um, young people's health and well-being starts with us supporting our staff health and well-being and that has been you know our main focus over the last sort of fortnight when we've been able to have staff larger groups of staff back in the building um, and that hasn't you know is necessarily yes there has been you know moving of desks etc because we've we've had to do that and then Put them back again and and look at think different different ways of, of of how we're going to approach our timetable but actually the main purpose of that was the reconnection because i think we can't underestimate for staff as well how difficult this has been particularly if they were shielding or were with someone that was shielding um, and we've really sort of seen how that that loss of connection has affected um colleagues as well as as the young people and it's about us working together as teams to ensure that everyone's in the right place to support for this pretty huge task that's coming our way, I think, in August. Thanks, um, Mary. Jen or Tina, do you want to finish? I would echo um, that completely. I think a sense of belonging. Um, in a community consultation meeting the other day, um, a colleague said, have kindness and empathy at the heart of everything we do for all of us in communities, in schools, with our teachers, with our parents, with our children, because everybody has been through um, a really stressful time and it's reconnecting. I love Jen's point about everybody being calm. I think that that's so important. Just you know, model, model what the, the young people need to see and we need to look after one another. Excellent. Thanks. Great advice. I need to remind myself to remain calm in August, no matter what it looks like in terms of timetable. But you are the timetabler. <laughs> yeah, deep just breaths. stay calm. Yeah, and positive. So, so Nicola, um, we're a bit early finishing. Is that okay? You're on mute, unless anyone's got any yeah, other no, questions. No, that's fine. Thanks, Shirley. So I mean, it's a beautiful big, day. So I'll say a big thank you to Mary and Jen and Tina and Shirley and Stephanie and Deb and Ruth, who have all been involved in developing this. Um, what we're planning to do with CEDA Connects is we've already started planning our autumn and winter series of events, and we're looking to revisit um, a number of uh, events that we've had. So we're revisiting Derek's and revisiting this one. Um, later in the year to see where we're at following up and I think that'll be a really interesting discussion because it's been really good today to hear um, these perspectives and, and the discussion that's come from that. Um, just before we finish up, the last thing is just to let you know that um, we have uh, more events coming up in June and July. So on Tuesday the 30th of June actually links quite well into the discussion we had today. We've got an inclusive education network they're having a launch event and um, from four o'clock until five o'clock and the link there for tickets is through eventbrite and if you go onto the CIRA website you'll be able to get the um you'll be able to link into that there it's on the CIRA latest section you'll be able to get into that um, and on um, thursday the 9th of july we've got professor mark priestley talking about what it means to make curriculum so we'll be looking at curriculum um, and what that means in a Scottish context, looking forward to the OECD review that's coming um, into Curriculum for Excellence there as well. And on the 23rd of July, we've got a conversation with Professor Walter Humes looking at Scottish education. Um, so we look forward to seeing you at those events. So a big thank you to um, everybody again today, everybody who's attended on our panel. Um, and uh, just a reminder that uh, if you're interested in getting more information about CIRA, go on to our website. You can join CIRA there as well um, and keep the conversation going on Twitter and social media using the hashtag, hashtag CIRA Connects. So I think you can now all go and enjoy the sunshine. Thank you. Um, if uh, Shirley and the panel want to just stay on, just uh, till everybody else is gone and I'll just thank you again personally. I'll do my best. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> and hope to see you again soon.